could it be electromagnetic? Could it be in the solar wind? Could it be gravity? Uh, something to think about. Uh, and with that, I'm going to now move into uh, my introduction. Are you ready? He is ready. Okay, so, yeah, an announcement. We're adaptive here. Hi, um, I'm, I'm looking for volunteers for the SSC conference coming up this June. So if anyone is interested in helping, it's June 5th through the 8th. Um, so please contact me and make sure that you send me an email so I can add you to the list and, and get uh, my the list established for email this thing. Thank you. All right. So James Sorensen's presence here today is the outcome of two recommendations from two of our members who heard him speak at Tesla Tech recently in Albuquerque. Uh, while he was there, he spoke on a new model of the atomic nucleus, and that coupled with today's promise of uh, looking at uh, gravity in a new way, uh, they have long-ranging impacts on what science may be willing to embrace. As a farm boy in Brush, Colorado, James has always been drawn to physics. Uh, when he visited Los Alamos National Laboratory, when he was 12, he found himself briefing his parents on fusion, age 12. When he was in junior high, he encountered Al uh, uh, Velikovsky's work, and if anybody you know about Velikovsky, you know that's pretty iconoclastic. So uh, that's in junior high. When he, uh, 10 years ago, encountered this theory, uh, I think it was on the Jeff Rents site, yeah, it changed uh, his whole world view. So James is an electrical engineer, a software programmer, and a website developer. That's his credentials, but his interest in what he really does is quite more interesting. Uh, he's had a, he has a keen interest for the myths of early man and believes these stories hold some truth that is too often dismissed and uh, when it doesn't fit in with our accepted scientific theories. So relax your preconceptions, Listen critically and be prepared to question what you want to understand better at the end of this talk. Please help me welcome James Sorensen. Thank you. Oh, you can't hear me, great. Stories from the Lakota Indians and the, and the Dakotas tell us of the Thunderbird who controlled the upper world and fought the serpents from the lower world. The Creator sang the song of destruction and sent down the fierce Thunderbirds to wage battle against the humans and the giant animals. The fight went on for a long time. At the height of the battle, the Thunderbirds suddenly threw down their most powerful thunderbolts all at once. The fiery blast shook the entire world, toppling mountain ranges and setting the forests and prairies ablaze. The flames kept leapt up to the sky in all directions, sparing only the fewest people on the highest mountaintops. It was so hot that the world's lakes boiled and dried up before their very eyes. Even the rocks burned up red hot and the giant animals and people burned where they stood. A great flood immediately followed, and when the survivors went out, they found bleached bones of the giant animals in modern or new rocks all over the landscape. These, these bones are still found today in the Dakota Badlands. Stories from all over the world tell of very similar situations in our myths and religions. And here at the top, we see the Thunderbird, which is found in totem poles of many, many different Indian tribes. It's not so much different than the story of the dragons coming from Europe and their total destruction of cities, where the Thunderbird or the large dragon attacked. It's a common theme, in fact, that we find electricity or these beams from the skies coming down and destroying large parts of the world. Up here on the right, we see Zeus holding above his head the thunderbolt. It was his magus weapon. And down here at the bottom, we see a picture of the Exodus with Moses. And you see at the back, the pillar of fire coming down from the heavens. So these stories have happened all over the world. Now, 
modern science doesn't believe these stories because their story is that the Earth evolved very slowly. The tectonic plates moved inches per year. And this causes mountain ranges to slowly form. And then erosion, water erosion and wind erosion gradually wear them back down. Occasionally there's an earthquake or a volcano that is local, but it affects a small area, but it isn't worldwide. But when these people went back out after these catastrophes, story after story, tell about mountain ranges rising literally within a night. And the sun suddenly, once the dust cleared and everything settled down, they went out to see where the sun would rise, because they had no idea where it was going to come up. And they changed their calendars to take it into account. So I'm here today to give you a story of the electric universe. It's a very different cosmological story than you've heard, so I would request you open your mind up to a whole bunch of new possibilities. I'm not going to cover any one subject for very long. I have about 30 or 40 subjects, and I get about two minutes per subject, so we're going to go pretty fast on this. But it's really, in order to begin to accept this theory, you really have to change the entire framework of what you've learned in order to make, have it make sense. So we're going to first start with a little bit about myths of religions. I kind of touched on that. And then get into our conventional cosmology. What does our cosmologists, our astronomers currently think about what's going on in the, in the heavens? And at the same time, we'll be talking about the electrical view of the same phenomena. And then I, I will talk some on the geology. Uh, as it turns out, you can find signs of electrical scarring all over the universe, all over the solar system, and on Earth. And so, in addition to water and wind erosion and volcanoes and earthquakes and tectonics, there's an electrical component that science does not take into account. It also affects our weather, and I think many of us here know that electricity is highly involved in our biology. Now this side over here, unfortunately, I'm not going to be able to get to. This is a lot more. The water is extremely important in, in electricity. It's actually the water molecule itself is bipolar, so it, it is electrical in nature. And then something I've been working on for two years now with a gentleman is a theory having to do with the structure of the nucleus of the atom. And what we're finding in this theory is that the atom itself is electrical in nature also. And what's really interesting is that has resulted in us studying transmutations of elements, which supposedly does not happen here on Earth. But we're finding there's a lot of proof that it happens in biology, it happens in our weather, it's possibly happening in our geology that elements are being converted into different elements here on Earth at low temperature. So a little bit about me. Um, I thank you for the introduction. I am an electrical engineer. I kind of lost interest in science in, in my high school years because it just got to be too strange. The idea of dark matter and disappearing <laughs> matter and things fading in and out of existence and all this didn't make sense to me. So I. I pretty much left science and went into something solid and concrete, computers. They do what they tell you, tell them. They do it again and again, even if it's wrong, and they're predictable. Whereas science just didn't make sense. And then 10 years ago, I found out about the electric universe, and it changed everything for me. So I had to put a cat up. Because I find that if you have a cat in your video, you're going to get a lot more views. You know, you see these. these these views on YouTube, they got 1 million views, and some science thing has got 10,000, so I'm hoping that maybe by putting a cat on, we'll get more views. Cat? But we live in an interesting time. We live in a time where you can study anything. You're no longer limited to what your pastor said. As my father lived in a little farm town, and they had very, you know, with the library, the information he could get to was very limited. And now with my computer and my phone, I can find so much stuff immediately and tell people about it and set up social media. So this is really, a, this, these theories like this would never make, make any headway if it weren't for our internet and the social media. Also, I have a website. Um, it posts the structured atom model and a little bit about geology. I haven't done a lot of work on it lately. Um, it, it's, but I put it up here. Um, hopefully in the next few months we'll be adding more information there. So myths and religious stories. As Paul mentioned, in junior high school, I was supposed to be studying in the library, and I wandered around instead and found a book called World's Inclusion by Emmanuel Velikovsky. How many are familiar with Velikovsky? Quite a few. Uh, he wrote a series of books. His first book went through a bunch of myths all over the planet, 
And he tried to find things that were similar between different cultures. And if, if one plan, maybe if Joshua fought the Battle of Jericho and the sun stopped, then possibly other theories or other cultures around the world would have similar stories. You'd think if the, if the sun stopped in one area of the planet, it would stop for others. Or if there was a great flood over here, there was probably a great flood over there. So he tried to tie all this together, and his main focus was on Egyptian history. And what he said, uh, what he said was that Egyptian history and Hebrew history seemed to have an 800 year difference between the two. The major events in each history was, didn't, didn't match up. And so he made this bold statement and said, you guys are wrong, and since he was a psychiatrist and not an uh, Egyptologist, they said, no, you're wrong, you can't even talk in our domain. And we're, going, we're not even going to listen to you. We aren't even going to read your book because you're obviously wrong. So this was a huge, huge affair. The Velikovsky affair actually was a monstrous affair in the, in the late 50s, early 60s. And that the scientists refused to even listen to Velikovsky. One of his claims also was that electricity was somehow involved in the planets, the orbits of the planets. And that there were other electrical effects, like Jupiter was going to put out radio noise and things like that, and the, the, the conventional cosmologists said, no, 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 no electricity in space. There is no electricity, it's gravity. Okay. You think about it, look at our world and how dependent we are on electricity. It's hard for me to imagine there is no electricity in space. So as I said, they probably refuted his work and said, you're wrong, before they even read it. They even threatened his book company that, they would, that the professors would quit buying his textbooks if they didn't quit publishing, or it was Macmillan. They would quit buying Macmillan's textbooks if they continued to publish Velikovsky's work. So they sold a best-selling book on the New York Times list to Doubleday, and, and Doubleday continued to publish it. They didn't have a textbook division. So one of his statements was that the electricity affected orbits, and this is taken from the Soho satellite. What we have found out is that Venus has a tail that almost touches the Earth. It's invisible, we, we can't see it, they detected it with a satellite. But his theory was that if that tail touches the Earth, it would actually create an electric circuit between the two. The people on Earth would not like it. It would cause nasty things to happen. And that Venus was in a an elliptical orbit and came very, very close to the Earth, I think it's every 52 years, and threatened the Earth. So we did things like build the underground cities in Turkey. Because we knew this thing was coming back and that it was going to cause destruction. So 30,000 people moved underground during these periods. So this story of, the, of massive catastrophes on Earth is pretty widespread. And his first book talked about that through myths and religion, but he was so ridiculed by it that he, because it was myths, that's not science, right? It's only man's history. So he, in his second book, he went through geological records and he found all kinds of examples of bones piled up hundreds of thousands of feet deep in cracks and rocks. He found massive peat deposits. He, he just found actual physical geographical evidence. And of course, they didn't read that either. <laughs> so then, I think he wrote a total of six books. Um, I show three, and then the fourth book is a whole series of books that were written about the affair where the scientists refused to listen to the guy. But he changed my life. Now, I, in, in junior high, I. I don't subscribe to all of his conclusions about what happened on the Earth, but he amassed a massive amount of evidence that something happened. Siberia, in Siberia, mastodons froze solid before their food could be digested. That's not a normal event. So this gentleman here is actually the main person that I've gotten a lot of this information from. He's named David Talbot. He has a website called Thunderbolts. And he actually worked with Velikovsky. He worked on the Velikovsky Reconsidered papers, some Pensy papers, you know, personally. And he's been the main proponent, the, call him the modern promoter for this theory. Um, he has a, a good theory on the thunderbolts of the guy, and the thunderbolt is the weapon that, that Thor's, at, Thor's hammer through thunderbolts. The planets threw thunderbolts at each other. Zeus had a thunderbolt. And this right here is the picture of the Thunderbolt. And you see this all over in lots of different, lots of different locations around the world. Um, and it's actually thought to be a plasma formation that was seen in the sky. He also wrote something called the Saturn myth. This is one thing I have my questions about. 
And then this idea is, if you pursue this, you're going to run into this, that he thought that Saturn was our original sun, and that Saturn, Mars, and Venus were all around the sun, around Saturn, and Saturn came into the current solar system and got ripped off, the planets got ripped off, and they're now, we now have a new sun. Um, I have a hard time seeing how anything could survive something like that, but this is his ideas. So I'm going to give you a lot of ideas that I may or may not completely subscribe to. I just really want to cover the whole idea of the, of the, elect, of the electric universe. Now this is a gentleman who worked at Los Alamos Laboratories, and the plasma laboratories on uh, nuclear fusion, nuclear bombs. He worked on very, very expensive equipment, and he, I'll bring him back up later, and show you some of that work, but after he had published his work, some people sent him in pictures of petroglyphs. And he goes, well, I know what that is. This one up here, this is the actual plasma formation. I'm afraid to touch the wrong button here. There's a point. Ah. So here's the plasma. This is a plasma formation. But in two dimensions, it looks like this. And this is just six examples, but this, is, this figure is found all over the world with the two dots on each side, some kind of a strange appendage down here. Both arms are quite often raised. Sometimes it's got a duck head. It's called the Squatter Man. And you can go to Albuquerque and just outside the city, you can see this carved into rocks. And so this is thought to be a plasma formation that was seen all around the world and written down by, the, by our ancient people. Now this here is actually taken from a Saturn, it's a cult, their website. So there's a Saturn cult. They are nothing to do with the electric universe. If you go online, you'll find they try to tie the two together. I've met one person from the Saturn cult in about eight conferences. It's not a part of the third. This formation up here is a very unstable formation, and it's not seen very often in the upper right. And Anthony Pratt, actually this, this is called a Pratt instability. They named it after him. He was so involved with plasma. When he saw that formation, huh? this formation, he realized that that was almost at the point of breaking up. And if, had it happened, it would have caused massive destruction all over. So he thinks that's why there's so few occurrence of this, of this formation. He went all over the southwest. He documented 67 different formations that he believes were plasma formations seen in the sky. So is gravity the dominant or basically only force that, is in our unit, in our, that works in our heavens? And just to give you an idea of what the sky is like, for those, just a quick update of, we first start with the, sun, the Earth, and then if we look, we see that the Earth now is part of our solar system of nine planets. That's a small button. So we have our nine planets in our solar system. If we move out a little farther, we get the Milky Way galaxy, thought to have 500 million stars somewhere around there. There are thought to be somewhere around 500 million galaxies. So we're, we're somewhere right here, right there. That's where we're at. One star. We move out farther, we get into the Virgo supercluster, and we now see that we're somewhere on, we're right here in this local galactic group where the red print is. But there's a bunch of clusters of galaxies all around us. We move out finder, far further, we find out the Virgo superclusters, just one small little teeny supercluster amongst all these other superclusters. And finally, we move out to the observable universe. And here's a picture that I think many of you have seen from the Hubble Space Telescope. Oh, yeah. And you can see galaxy after galaxy after galaxy in this image. They actually, I think, spent 100 hours about to sit in a, a dark spot in the sky, and after 100 hours came up with this picture. Now what we're talking about, this is actually an image, a drawing a, that was made, but this is to show all these galaxies are now, in, they believe, are interconnected with a web. And they don't really understand what this web is. And I would quite simply say it's an electric, it's all electric. These are electric currents running here. So just to give you an idea of how big our galaxy is, if we took our sun and shrunk it down to a dust speck, so you know you're sitting in your lounge chair and you got these things floating in the air and they sparkle, imagine that's our sun. The Earth would be about three inches away, and Pluto would be about six feet away. Now how far away is it to the first, the closest dust speck next to our dust speck? I already gave the answer, it's four miles. So we have a dust speck here, our sun, and four miles away is the very next closest dust speck. And everything in between is thought to be empty. 
We've been told that for a long time, but it's not. It's actually filled with a very thin plasma. So therefore, the diameter of the Milky Way galaxy is about halfway to the moon. So this just gives you an idea of the emptiness of space and how vast it really is. So in the conventional cosmologies, we have some very basic ideas, and these are the two primary ones that these are built on. And that, number one, we have Doppler shift, and I'll get into that in a second. But they believe that they can measure the distance to faraway objects by looking to see if they have a red or blue color. And I'll describe that a little more in, in a little bit later. But because they believe this, they think we can measure velocity and distance to objects that are outside of our galaxy. And the second major premise of, of our cosmology today is that gravity is the dominant or basically only force that's acting in the universe. You, can, you used to be able to, I don't know if you still can, get a PhD in cosmology and never study electricity because there is no electricity in space. And that's hard to imagine. The result of this is that we have the Big Bang Theory, 13.7 million years ago, an explosion happened and all of a sudden, out of nothing came everything. And it's still expanding. And they think it might even be expanding faster and faster. And therefore, there must be something called dark energy to push it apart. It's pushing the galaxy apart. We don't know what it is, we can't measure it, but we think it's there. Um, another basic premise is that black holes exist at the center of every galaxy. If you, um, I'll get back to that a little bit more. We got dark matter also, which is a, to me it's a blank check. If you need some mass, you just stick dark matter into your theory and you got, you got the answer. It solves your equations. Um, we also believe stars are fusion reactors and that space is full of clouds of hot gas. Um, and that it's electrically neutral. So these are kind of a little, a few of the ideas of, of modern cosmology. Um, to get back to the Doppler shift, if you hear a train go by, it goes, nah, 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 it drops in pitch. And so the reason is, is as it's coming towards you, the distance is shortening, so you get a high pitch. And as it goes away from you, the distance is lengthening, so you get a lower pitch. And they believe the same thing can happen with light. If light is coming towards us, it turns it blue to a higher frequency. As it goes away from us, it stretches out and turns it red. And then when they look outside of our galaxy, they find that almost everything's red. Everything's red. There's a few objects that are blue, but they are far and few between. So that is why we believe that the universe is expanding. It's because of this redshift. And they believe the red, that the redshift is solely caused by the velocity. It's moving away or, from, or towards you. What if they're wrong? What if there's something else determining redshift? They also use it to calculate um, distance. Now that involves the assumption that everything's expanding uniformly, which is a pretty big assumption in my opinion. But from that, when they say something's two billion light years away, this is what they're measuring, is redshift. The color of the planet is shifted just a little red. And you can see that here, this would be the normal spectrum. This is shifted red a little, and this is shifted to the blue a little. One of the results of that is we have what's called the fingers of God. And so this is when we measure, this is Earth, and we look out towards the end of the universe, we see that we see these fingers that point right back to the Earth. So we are in the center of the universe. How about that? Um, this can also be interpreted in a different way. What if this whole thing is really a cluster, and this stretching out is our misinterpretation of redshift? So. There's actually a gentleman, I think he's next. How about that? Houghton Art. He spent 26 years at Mount Calabar and Mount Wilson looking through a telescope. He worked with Hubble and did some studies with him a long time ago. He wrote the book called The Art of Atlas of Peculiar Galaxies, 330 some galaxies that, that don't fit the conventional theory. He, um, a lot of them are named after him because he found them. Um, and he came up with some weird results. Like, what we find is we find two objects with a 0.616, and don't worry about what the number means, but this is their measurement of redshift. And these are very, very similar. They're almost the same. And so he started finding pairs of objects in the sky that were very close together that had very similar redshifts. And what he started doing was looking in between them, and he'd always find something there. And what he usually found was a ciphered galaxy, or what they call a disturbed galaxy. Something's weird about it. And so these, since they're very, very deeply redshifted, they should be way, way, way out there, somewhere New York. Whereas this guy, you know, he's right next, right next door. So how can it be 
it must just be a coincidence. This object just happens to line up perfectly with these two distant objects. And, you know, many people win the lottery, right? Well, and then he found another one, and another one. People started sending them in. And so, all of a sudden, you find out that these family has two twin daughters, and they both live next door, and they won the lottery. That's cool. Well, he's now found hundreds of families that have twin daughters that live next door, and they won the lottery. The, the mathematics are, it's improbable that that's what's really happening. So he believes, what his theory is, is that this original parent galaxy actually ejected two objects simultaneously, and they went out, and they actually come back now. It's come back, this is a pretty deep theory, I can't get into it very far, but they, they create their own small, small sub-galaxies. And the reason they're red is because they're young. Older, older galaxies are bluish, newer galaxies are red. Um, another example he gives, a little bit different, is we have this NGC 4319, which is a galaxy, and then we have this Markarian 205, and they appear to be connected together by a gas. Well, once again, this one is thought to be way far away, and this is thought to be close. And so it just happens to coincide, they line up. But he shows example after example after example showing this connection between these objects. And the Southern Cross is a great example or Einstein, Einstein, whatever, down in the Southern Hemisphere. Um, I, here's an example of a quasar, which is thought to be very, very far away, in front of another galaxy. And this galaxy is pretty much opaque. You can barely see through it. So why can we see this object that's very far away? And his answer is, it's not. It's right there very close. These quasars are also thought to be extremely powerful. They put out more energy, like a million times more energy than our entire galaxy. And the reason is, is because we think they're so far away that just the fact we can see them, they have to be extremely powerful. But if they're very close, but they may not be that strong at all. They might not be that, that much, putting out that much light. I'd like to get into this chart. To me, this is an irrefutable proof. Um, this is numbers taken from Hubble's telescope. You can see there's a correlation. It's really it's showing the cipher galaxies and the X-ray objects around it. And this correlation to me, I, I've done statistics for quite a while. I took one look at that and said, there was no big thing. That's, I don't need any more. That one chart will do it. So if you want to read more, I don't have the book with me. Seeing Red by Hal Nark will tell you in great detail about all of this. So black holes. How many have seen a black hole? How many have seen a picture of black holes? Um, Pretty good. Um, no one has seen a picture of a black hole, by the way. We've never imaged a black hole. Every black hole you have seen is an artist's conception. And so what is a black hole? Well, they looked at the galaxy. And if you think of our, our solar system, we have a sun at the middle. And the sun is very, very big and very strong, and it holds our, our solar system together. You look at a galaxy, and there's no central sun. There's no central huge massive object to hold the soul of the galaxy together. So the mathematics of gravity failed. It just outright failed. And they said, well, what can we do about this? Well, we'll stick a black hole there. Oh, well, no, we'll make it a supermassive black hole. Oh, we'll make it a heavy supermass, whatever. They have all kinds of terms. They put black holes now everywhere they need mass. They stick a black hole. Because first of all, no one's ever going to see it. And so it works. Yeah. And then there's a lot of controversy. You'll find this on the web. This is where it got divided by zero, the mathematics of the black hole, and, the, and that's an illegal thing. Most high school and some junior high students could probably tell you that you don't divide by zero. So there's a lot of controversy about what a black hole really is. And I would say what it is, is it's a correction factor for gravitational theory that didn't work without sticking a whole bunch of mass somewhere. Because that's what it really is. I think gravity is directly correlated to mass. You have a little bit of mass, you have a little gravity, a little bit more mass, you have more gravity, more mass, you have more gravity. So in order to get more gravity at the center of the galaxy, you've got to stick something into the middle of it. And we call them black holes. <laughs> so spiral barred galaxies. So this is a different issue now. If you look at our solar system, Pluto goes around, I mean, Mars, Mercury goes around the, the first planet in 88 days. And I think this Earth goes around in a year. Pretty sure. And Pluto has not gone around yet since we found it. Yeah. It's like 240 years. So the inner planets go around very quick, the outer planets go around slow. Okay, that's cool. Newton's, Newton's math works. 
with the galaxy, what they find is that this star out here, a galactic year, is almost the same as this star here. And that they go around it almost the exact, have the same year. Now this one has to go around a lot faster. But they both go together. And that totally goes against the mathematics of the solar system. So what they decide is that we're not seeing all the mass. There must be a whole bunch of mass in here that makes it like a solid plate. So what did they do? They created dark matter. And they stick it wherever they need it. You can find all kinds of cool pictures on the web showing you exactly where the dark matter is, even though no one has seen it, no one's observed it, no one knows how to figure out what it is. There's all kinds of different kinds of dark matter. But it obviously works because gravity is still the only real force we consider in, in cosmology. Back in 1956, this gentleman, Winston Bostick, was published in newspapers as, as having created a test tube in a, uh, a galaxy in a test tube. And you can see some of those pictures. And he's using plasma. He's using electricity to do this. Another gentleman by the name of Anthony Pratt, which I mentioned earlier, did the petroglyphs. He worked at a uh, laboratory to find out the hardening of radiation against early, early computers back in the 70s. And in this machine that generated these massive amounts of x-rays, he observed small spiral-shaped forms that looked like galaxies. And he was familiar with Winston Bostick's work, so he actually got a job, intentionally got a job at Los Alamos Labs to create a computer simulation. And this was done in 1991. This computer simulation shows how two plasma currents, called the Birkeman current, will spin together and create the spiral bar galaxy. And this is something conventional cosmologists are having a really hard time to do with gravity. They really don't have a theory for what creates the spiral bar galaxy. Um, so what does this mean? This means it's an embarrassment that the dominant forms of matter in the universe are hypothetical. <laughs> well, what we have is Dark energy takes up this much of known matter, or of our known, I'm not sure if you'd call it matter. Dark, energy, or dark matter is here, dark energy is here, and this little part is the part we see. This is the stars and the black holes are part of that, by the way. Um, nebula, quasars, everything we see is just 5%. And everything else, we, don't, we can't find it, we don't know where it is, but it makes our gravity equations work, so it's got to be there according to them. So this results in some basic ideas that the Big Bang occurred 13.7 billion years ago and it's still expanding. Um, that our solar system is actually coming from a third generation star. A star blew up, it created a new star, that one blew up, and that created our star. So we have a third generation star about 5 billion years old. The planets were formed where they are today and haven't moved for 5 billion years. You know, there's Based that part, they, they don't get closer to each other, they just, I mean, they rotate, but the orbit doesn't get further out or closer in, according to conventional cosmology. And since gravity sucks, it is a one way connection, everything's coming in. It's like everything's an isolated little body that doesn't communicate with anything else. Um, and there's, there's no way for, as I said, communication, which makes astrology impossible, right? Um, so how accurate? One of the best ways to tell if a theory is really working is to, to, to compare the theory and, and make predictions. And so how well is the theory doing? And you can go on the web, or you can look at Science Magazine, Sky and Telescope, and read these articles over and over again. Astronomers are astounded by an X-ray flash. Astronomers still clueless about the mystery force pushing galaxies apart. Astronomers astounded by a deep explosion. Again and again and again, the theories do not predict what we are finding. So in electric cosmology, what's the answer? First of all, in order for a theory to get accepted, it has to go through a pretty difficult process. And what typically happens, you come up with a new theory and they say, well, obviously, we're just going to ignore it, that's a fake theory, we're not even going to pay attention to you. And eventually it starts to get a little bit of ground, and so they say, well, yeah, okay, there might be electricity, but it doesn't do anything. And then finally they say, oh yeah, we knew there was electricity all along, and that's, that's what we've been teaching you guys. So this is the three steps to, to get a theory accepted. You think science is people out there looking for an answer. It's people supporting their dogmas and their beliefs. And science lives on funding. You are not going to get money if you decide to put out a theory against the Big Bang. You just won't get funded. 
Um, and then we have a quote here by Einstein saying that once the mathematician started playing with relativity, he no longer understood it himself. <laughs> And then John Herschel said, and he wrote it to Michael Faraday. Michael Faraday is the guy who discovered electricity, basically. He said, we stand on the verge of a vast cosmical discovery, such as nothing here to imagine compared with. Um, and it hasn't happened. I mean, most people in this room, I'm just curious how many people have heard of this crazy theory before the electric universe. So it's very, very limited exposure. It takes a long time. Um, so Max Planck at the turn of this uh, last century, at the turn of 19, he said uh, science advances one funeral at a time. So once the people who own the money and have the theories die, then new ones, and that's, this is his true theory. This is the true quote, and this is the way you usually hear it paraphrased. Uh, so gravity is an extremely weak force. Electromagnetism is 10, and it says 36th, and I read this morning 39th power, so who cares? 10 to the 39th power stronger than, electric, than than gravity. Electricity is that much stronger. If there are electrical offense, effect, effects going on in our universe, then the gravitational equations mean nothing. They do nothing compared to the electricity. Yet all of our cosmology is based on gravitational mathematics. So this is why they cannot even begin to introduce electricity. It just messes, it just ruins the whole game. To start saying that there's maybe comets are electric or um, you know maybe some geology. If they start adding electricity suddenly, their theories go out the door. Oh, cool. So this isn't a new thing. This actually, as I said, Michael Faraday took a magnet and found out that an, a compass, electric current, will deflect a compass. He believed that electricity was going to be important in our cosmos. Clerk, James Clerk Maxwell wrote the formulas for electricity. He was a very a big proponent of the, you can see his quote over here, the phenomenon of electrical discharge are exceedingly important and when they are better understood they will throw light, great light on the nature of electricity as well as the nature of gases in the medium pervading space. So James Clerk Maxwell was a big proponent. Christian Berkland spent a lot of time at the North Pole observing the auroras. He didn't have a supercomputer to sit in his office and and guess at what was happening, he actually went out and measured. And you'll find in the electric universe, it's not theorists, it's the plasma scientists, it's the people who built our TV sets and our generators that support this theory. It's really, it, the people who observe it on a day-to-day -day basis. And Kurt, Christian Berglund was one of these guys, we'll talk a little bit more about him. Irving Langmuir um, actually coined the term plasma, he thought it, that the plasma in space looked a lot like blood plasma and it was almost like a living organism, so he called it plasma. We have Ralph Jurgens who wrote about the electric sun. Um, Hannes Alfane um, actually created a theory that said that the magnetic fields, we, we observe magnetic fields all over the place, and he said, well these magnetic fields are frozen into the plasma, or into the, into, into the plasma. And when he received his Nobel Prize for this theory, he got up and said, you know, I was wrong. Um, you guys are going to totally misinterpret this, and you're going to use it to explain everything. And he was right. That's exactly what they do, is they use it. So he, at the moment he learned, he's standing there accept, accepting his Nobel Prize, he had the gall to stand up and say, I was wrong. Don't take, me, don't take my word for it. Um, we mentioned Anthony Pratt a little bit earlier. And then Hal Mark, who I also talked about. So these are just a few. For every name that I present today, there's 10 or 15 more names behind it. So I had to be selective. I didn't have seven hours to give this presentation. So I had to be selective in what I talk about. And I'm trying to pick out the main names. But there literally are hundreds of people that are involved in, in the electric universe theory. So what's different? Well, we've been sending out really cool toys. We've got telescopes in space. We look at x-rays. We look at radio waves. We look at magnetic fields, we've sent probes to planets. Um, we've, we now have technology that they didn't have during Einstein's time. For example, we didn't know what plasma was, hardly, when Einstein died. So believe it or not, he didn't include it anywhere in his theories, because he didn't know what it really, I mean, they knew about it, but they hadn't investigated it. We now have all these different methods, all these different equipment, we have spectrometers. The equipment we have now is, is so far beyond, and we keep discovering again and again things that just don't fit. Like, I didn't actually do a slide on comets, 
But we, the conventional theory is a comet is a snowy or a, I, what is a dirty snowball now because first they thought it was a snowball, but now they thought it looks like dirt, so now it's a dirty snowball. So they sent up a probe, and this probe was going to shoot hard harpoons into this planet, and they're going to pull this probe down onto the planet. It bounced. The harpoons <laughs> didn't work. It's solid rock. Every, every comet we look by at looks like solid rock. They're dark, they're, some of them are very dark. They are emitting what they think is a water vapor, but we believe, the electric universe believes, that it's really a plasma with a hydroxide or OH, and all it needs is another H, and you get water. But it's a, mis a misinterpretation of the tail. It's really an electric plasma. It's not a, a also, the comets should eventually dissipate and go away. But they keep coming back and keep coming back. They come back a little smaller, but not near as fast as if they were actually water that's coming off on the tail. So what is a plasma? I keep mentioning this word. It's called the fourth state of plasma. We all learned about solids, gases, and liquids. Well, there's really a fourth state called plasma. And this conventional science totally agrees with this. They feel like most of the heavens are made of plasma. Um, the electric universe believes almost everything's made of plasma that we see in space. But the fourth state of matter, if we start with a solid right here, it's all nicely aligned and it doesn't, it's very rigid. If we put a little bit of energy into it, it starts to move around and we get a liquid. If we put a bunch of energy into it, it turns into a gas. And finally, if we put enough energy in it, then the electrons start getting stripped off of the nucleus. So you end up, that's what a plasma is, it's very simple. Um, and the, so the plasma TVs, well, I'll get to that in a second. Um, it's an ionized gas, it's got a lot of energy. As I said, Lang Langer called it plasma because it looked like blood, and it behaves in very predictable ways. Well, if a plasma, if you have a plasma passing another plasma, they're going to generate an electric current. And also, as a plasma moves, it's going to generate a magnetic field. And so there's some, and also plasmas like to organize into cells, and that's why, into groupings, and that's why Langer called it a plasma. It's also a great conductor of electricity. And lightning is an example of plasma. Um, uh, this one, this one kind of looks out of place, but so what we observe when we look into space this is called a Har Biggs Harrow object, I think. Um, and you see this thing coming off of it. Well, if that were a gas, it would dissipate in all directions. But for some reason, these things maintain their shape, and they are collimated for tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of light years. These things go for massive distances. And conventional science cannot figure out why in the heck they stay together in the shape they do. We know that there are things moving within them. We have seen them actually change. And they appear to have filamentation inside of them. This is an example of an electrically confined plasma, or magnetically confined plasma. This is the Crab Nebula. And we look at it, and you can see this idea of the cellular shapes. You can see the filamentation in it and all this. But when you look at it in an X-ray, you get that. So this is inside of here. We see a cylinder and this jet coming off, and now they've actually found an object that's connected to the end of this jet. Um, so what in the world is that? This is, is this an exploding star, what they think? This is a, a supernova happened and created this thing? And I would say no, we got a lot more going on here. And here's some other examples of filamentation. This, if you get a big blow up of this one, you'll see this thing is just completely full of lines. Um, here we have what we in the electric universe think is an actual electric current. It's a conductor. And then we get some weird shapes like this. Um, you get a lot of very, very interesting structure for exploding stars. Because that is the conventional idea for where these nebula comes from. So on Earth, what do we do with plasma? Or what do we do with electricity? Well, we run our entire world. We make electromagnets mainly, and when you look in space, you see all these magnetic fields. They don't know where those magnetic fields come from. And on Earth, we use electric, electricity. We have radio waves. If you look at uh, galaxies, a galaxy might be this big. It's got radio lobes this big. And how in the world is that galaxy generating radio waves? And that's something we use electricity once again here on Earth. We got heat and light, we have accelerating particles, we have communication of information, you know, my cell phone, I can communicate all over the world. 
electricity is thought to actually communicate information in space. We've got x-rays and radiation. There's a lot of things on Earth we use electricity for. What do they use in cosmology? They have to smash things together. They have colliding galaxies, they have exploding, and then they have exploding stars. And that's really about the only two things they can use, gravity, collisions, and exploding stars, to try to generate radio waves and magnetic fields and light and heat and all this other stuff. And if they were just to take a class in electricity, they could do that, you know? So it actually operates in three modes, dark mode, glow mode, and hard mode. So of course we got our own dark, dark matter or dark, dark plasma. But a lot of the plasma doesn't have enough energy to, to light up. Once it lights up, it's like a light bulb of fluorescent light. Um, it gets even hotter and you get arcs, you get plasma arcs. Um, it's known to separate things when we look into these nebula, we see separation of elements. And this can be done through plasma. Um, it forms tubes, long term tubes, that can carry this electric currents for, for massive distances. And it's scalable, so you can do in your laboratory a, a little three inch plasma, and it pretty much applies to a multi 10,000 year or light year plasma. It's a very scalable thing. And then they pinch, these plasma tubes, when they reach a certain charge, they'll pinch together into a, into a single point. It organizes into cells. Um, it, it, it creates patterns that are repeatable and can and be predicted. And electricity, this is more electricity I think than plasma, induces rotation. And this is a big question in cosmology, is what makes the sun rotate and why should it? What keeps it rotating? Why does the center of the sun rotate faster than the poles? Um, it's being driven by electricity. Uh, you, there's actually a rule of electricity that you grab a hold of a wire and you stick your hand on it. It's called the right hand rule. If the electricity is falling on your thumb, the magnetic field rotates this way. So rotation is a property of electricity. It's not something you have to create some new invisible particle to describe. Uh, it's scalable and we can actually experiment with it. We've never experimented with dark matter or dark energy or black hole on Earth, but we can experiment with plasma. So here's some examples of plasma. We have the aurora borealis, we have a candle flame, fluorescent tube or neon tubes. We know that these loops up here are made from plasma. Um, a few examples of plasma, the plasma ball. This is actually a, a plasma rocket engine. Oops, that's cool. Okay, so here's a plasma. This is in, being done in a laboratory. Um, these are, I think, clean room equipment. Here's another rocket engine. This is a plasma welder. You can use plasma to weld. I actually got a chance to, I had to cut some three quarter inch steel, and I used a plasma cutting torch, and it's really cool. It's a lot better than oxyacetylene to cut, cut three quarter inch thick steel. But one thing we use is we use plasmas in the semiconductor industry to create teeny tiny little geometries like this. So all of the chips that we use, I was in the electronics industry for 30, 20 some years, and we use it to etch, to remove material selectively. And it's called electric discharge machining. And we'll get back to this idea in a little bit. So conventional science calls it a hot gas. They talk about a hot gas moving at almost the speed of light. Uh, well, believe it or not, a hot gas moving at the speed of light is a plasma. It is not a hot gas. It behaves electromagnetically. It does not behave like a gas. It does not follow Bernoulli's laws or Kirchhoff's gas laws. It follows electromagnetic Maxwell's equations, all the, the stuff we know from science, um, from our industry. They, they call something a bow shock or shock wave. We call it in the electric universe a double layer. It's something that forms, the, the plasma will form into multiple layers. Um, they have a magnetosphere or a heliosphere, and we call it a plasma sheath that wraps around the planet. We have the solar wind, or they call that a rain of charged particles. Well, charged particles in motion is electricity. Simple as that. It's not a rain of charged particles, it's electricity. And then they have magnetic ropes. Well, we feel that's being created by the electricity. And then the Z pinches doesn't really mind. Well, these, these all lined up. This one's kind of by itself. And that's where the, the plasma is pinched down into a point. So it's not a gas. Oops. I didn't finish this slide. As you can see here, the, the, a plasma is neutral. It's got both the positive ions and the negative electrons. Well, here's the positive ions getting pulled to this. There's the negative electrons getting pulled to that. 
will not get that from a gas. This is electrical. Berglund, I mentioned earlier, he went to the North Pole. He almost had a couple of people freeze to death. He looked at the auroras with magnetometer. He said, oh, these auroras are being powered by the sun. And it took about 70 some years before the Navy set up, well, yeah, before they sent up some satellites and they said, oh, the auroras are being powered by the sun. How about that? <laughs> um, this is called a Torella. It's a vacuum chamber. He's got a magnetic field inside of it. And he's trying to simulate what he thinks is going on inside the electric sun, the electric earth, the electric bodies. This is an example of, of the uh, of solar flares on the sun. This is an example of what he found inside of his equipment. If you see, here's another example. This is inside his equipment. You can see these rings that look like auroras. Here's Saturn. We got auroras. Oh, same picture. Cool. Um, I thought I had one more. He also found a way to image, how about that? Uh, he has the rings of Saturn. He has one that shows multiple rings, and that's another thing that scientists, cosmologists, really have not figured out is what creates rings. And he did it inside this equipment. They eventually awarded him, he's on the donut, Danish kroner. He's, he's, he's on the bill, the 200 kroner bill. And he won, I don't know if he won a Nobel or not actually for it. Now these are examples of Z-pinches. Here we see where it pinches down into a coin. And we see a coin again. Here we see double layers. Where you see the two different layers being formed. This is another nebula that's got these circles. Um, you can see how they pinch together though, down to a single point. Oh, oh, there we go. Here's the rings of Saturn. It's out of order. And there he is on the Danish kroner. That's his equipment at the bottom. The picture at the top is an actual picture of Saturn. Here's more examples of filamentation, pinches, um, this, these very, very intricate, very sophisticated forms. Now, one problem with plasma is it's way too complicated. We can't, we can't calculate what's going on, even with a supercomputer, what's going on in the, inside of these things, because there's just so much interaction. So they really have to do estimations right now plasma. This is a gentleman, um, if you want to read about the electric universe, a great opening book is The Electric Sky by Donald Scott. It's very much in layman's terms, and it covers a lot of the ideas I've, I've gone over today. This bottom left picture is actually a computer simulation I'm working on him with. He's trying to come up with mathematics for describing what a Birkeland current is. And these Birkeland currents, named after Christian Birkeland, are thought to connect the stars together, connect the galaxies together, come into the, the, the planets on the poles. Um, and so this, I, what, what they do is they have a tendency to twist. And not only does electricity have a tendency to cause things to rotate, but it likes to split into twos. And we know that of our stars out in the universe, that some 60 some percent of them are, are binary stars. Our star is kind of unique in that it's a single star by itself. Most star systems are binaries. And that would be explained by this tendency of electricity to, to want to break into twos. And you can see, if you look here, these are actually the same thing in different, different frequencies. You can see it looks like a helical twist to it. This is the mathematics that we're using over here. As it turns out, this current is thought to have matter going this way, and then it starts to rotate a little further out, and then it comes back that way, and then it goes this way, and this way, and so it's kind of complicated. But what's really neat is that the magnetic fields coming off of this are a power of one over the square root of r, which means that they go for a long, long, long ways. The magnetic fields have a large effect over a large distance. Um, so this is a controversial one. I debated about this slide a lot. Um, we believe the sun is a nuclear fission, fusion reactor, which we believe that it's got helium, and under extreme pressure, extreme temperature, the helium is pushed together. The helium, I said helium. Okay, it's got hydrogen, which is just a single proton. And then when you push two of these protons together, actually you have to do four of them, minor point, you get helium. So they, they believe that our sun is, is doing nuclear fusion reactions. And so they're trying to repeat this. This is a project called ITER in southern France. It was started in 1985. Gorbachev and Reagan started this project. They're hoping to turn it on in 2025. 
And then they actually hoped 10 years later to get it up to where they might be able to prove the theory. It's a $40 billion project. They are trying to recreate the high pressure and the high temperature that they think is inside the sun and repeat what's going on. Now, we, we do know how to do this. We've created hydrogen bombs. And that is, that is an uncontrolled version of this reaction. But no one has been able to control it. Um, and this is our latest attempt. This is a multinational attempt of 40 million bucks. And it's massive. I don't know if you see this. You know, Here's a truck right there. Um, and so the joke about fusion is it's only 30 years away. And it's always going to be that way. This is, I've been reading about fusion since I was a kid in popular science. I remember reading about the Tacoma reactor, Tacoma reactors. And we probably spent over a trillion dollars on this project as a, as a race. Is there a better answer? This is called Sapphire. The Electric Universe started this project. They're wanted, they're, they call it a star in a jar. And so they're trying to recreate the electric sun instead of the fusion sun. And this device here, uh, human, they, uh, I was told that eight people could fit inside the, the main chamber. Um, these are the five guys running it. What, what we have inside is we have two huge copper cathodes and an anode in the center. And I think I got that backwards. I think these are anodes and that, it doesn't matter. Um, and what they do is they inject into here helium and then they get these really cool shapes out. So here's the, the anode in the middle with all these little tufts on it. Um, you get different shapes. Um, they, they've actually, so, so in the inner reactor, they're trying to force this plasma into a certain shape. This plasma is self-organizing. They don't have to do anything. It's shaping itself. There's no massive magnets trying to hold this in place. And when they turn this puppy on, they did all kinds of computer simulations. How much heat's it going to generate? Is it going to melt our tungsten and electrodes? They did all, they show all this different mathematics they went through when they, when they created this thing. And then they turned it on, and it put out massive amounts of heat. And what you see here is this blue thing, and this right here is a shroud that they added in this monster fan to cool this thing off. So that's the goal. They want to create heat. You create heat, you boil water, you power a steam generator, get rid of gas. That's what they're trying to do with fusion. That's what they've done with fission. Fission reactors, all our nuclear reactors, it generates heat. That's what they're trying to do with cold fusion. It generates heat. This thing generates lots of heat. But they don't get it. They don't know what's going on. They're, they're putting in helium, and they're getting out 34 different elements. Now, some of them are contamination, probably. But they don't know what's really going on inside this thing. I think this, it's about $10 million now, will beat the $40 billion iter to nuclear fusion. Oh, how about that? I'm just going to skip that one. So this gentleman here is Walt Thornhill. I mentioned David Talbot earlier as the mythologist that had the Saturn idea. He met up with Walt Thornhill about 30 some years ago and Walt is a physicist and they realized that they were talking about the same things. One was describing it in myths, one was describing it in physics and they've gone together now and they're the two major proponents now for the Electric Universe, if you go online and read about it. Um, one thing that he brought up, all brought up, is this idea, this is, a, once again, electronics, this is called electric discharge machining, how do you etch something straight down without undercutting? And plasma will do that. Well, this is a crater, and the idea is, is that this was actually electrically discharged machine. It was not caused by an asteroid hitting the surface, for one reason, these things are almost always round. You ever see an elliptical crater anywhere? You won't find them. There's a center peak. How in the world do you get a center peak? The conventional idea is it's a rebound, but this is a plasma that it, it, these two currents go around and leave the center behind. Another thing is we see edge craters. And edge craters, the probability of the number of edge craters found on craters is it's mathematically impossible that you know, a thousand years later, this just happened to hit the edge, and this one just happened to hit the edge. So those are just, as the current, as the, as the plasma pulls up off the surface, it strikes the highest point and leaves behind these little sub-craters. This is a picture taken from of Mars. This is Dallas Marineris. It covers one-third of the surface. It's huge. The Grand Canyon, the eh, Grand Canyon's about that big compared to this thing. And what we see is that this area up here is 
etched out four kilometers deeper. And this is highlands. This is very smooth. This is very rough. The, the top and bottom of Mars is very different.